an overview of the Gospel of Luke, chapters 14 and 15, Attitudes That Matter Forever. Continuing in section 5 of the Gospel of Luke, Journey to Death, Messianic Signs and Teaching. Human Attitudes Matter Forever. First, Attitudes Towards Jesus. Not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Secondly, attitudes towards others. There is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Attitudes towards Jesus. Human attitudes matter. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus will use this remark to talk more about the coming kingdom. Remember, in biblical usage, the phrase, the one who, is the equivalent of everyone who. Blessed means to be happy, such as a poor man enjoying a feast with friends. Now, the phrase kingdom of God has several meanings in Scripture. Let's review them. Sometimes this is a reference to God who is creator and king over everything, from everlasting to everlasting. Secondly, God is judge over lesser gods, over kings, and over everyone else. God was the national protector over Israel. In Jesus' day, believers were waiting for a Messiah king who would defeat Israel's enemies and make Israel great again, one reason for which Jews to this day deny that Jesus be the Messiah. When Jesus came, he taught that he is the Messiah and that those who obey him are members of God's kingdom. In Christianity, King Jesus lives within us, giving us guidance, hope, joy, and self-control. None of those guests. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I cannot come. What do you think of their excuses? I must go see the field that I bought. I must go try out my new oxen. Who would have bought oxen without having tried them out? I have just got married. Who would have arranged to get married the same date as a promised banquet? So, what do these excuses have in common? First, they all relate to ordinary affairs of everyday life. And, of course, no one would buy property sight unseen. Apparently, none counted either the master or his servant worthy of their respect. Attitudes matter. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, 
Uh, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the roads and the country lanes and compel them to come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus was applying this to his own coming kingdom. So, to whom was Jesus comparing this story? Why might people today choose to refuse Jesus' offer of forgiveness and of everlasting life? What is this man carrying? Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. What was Jesus intimating about what would happen to him at Jerusalem? This kind of speech is known as hyperbole, use of an obvious intentional exaggeration. In traditional societies, audiences love this kind of speech. So what does this hyperbole suggest about our loyalty to Jesus? What does it mean to take up one's cross? Later, the Apostle Paul would write, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Jesus was soon to give up everything. I used to live on the edge of the Sahara Desert, where camels laden with rock salt were a common sight. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When rock salt becomes moist, the sodium chloride leaches out, leaving tasteless rock. Attitudes towards others. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on its shoulders and goes home. In some parts of the world, it remains a practice. When a sheep wanders away and you find it, you break its legs so it cannot walk. Then you put it around your shoulders and for the next few weeks you carry it everywhere. You feed it with your own hands, and it drinks from your cup. The sheep bonds with you until it will never want to wander away again. Rejoicing in Heaven Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. Heaven, where God, Jesus, angels, and we saved folk 
live together, dwell together forever. There will be rejoicing. We will be happy, fulfilled, in dwelling new bodies with relationships reconciled. In heaven there is no sin, evil, disease, death, or demons. Nevertheless, we shall be very busy. We shall become powerful, intelligent, learning skills to become all that God wants for us. With great rewards, we will reign and rule over the world, over nations, and over angels, and probably over every planet of the entire universe. By way of summary, God created the heavens, the earth, and the underworld. At first, heaven and earth dwelt together in Eden. After the fall, Jesus descended from heaven, where he endured the cross, whereupon he went into the underworld, and then came forth victorious, rising into the heavens bodily. Whilst awaiting his return, when the body dies, the righteous go to be with Jesus in the heavens, whereas the wicked descend into the underworld. Upon Jesus' return, all dead bodies that belong to him will rise and reign with him forever in the new heaven and the new earth, whereas the Christ rejectors will be raised and judged and condemned to the second death in the underworld. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What does it mean to repent? There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So the man divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the carob pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. Anatomy of Repentance Repentance begins by thinking rationally. I have messed up. I am suffering the consequences of my choices. However, Jesus offers what I need. So, I will speak to Jesus. I will say, I have sinned against God and others. I admit that I deserve nothing but judgment. But please accept me. Forgive me. I will obey your commands. Start doing so now. But whilst he was still a long way off, 
His father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Your Creator strongly desires that you repent and return to him. The moment you do so, he will flood your heart with the love that he has for you. The father said to his servants, Let's have a feast and celebrate, for the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Now, how shall we deal with the obvious fact of non-converted Christians, those who have no life within them? This can result from certain denominations who teach, trust the church and its ceremonies, but do not demand that you repent and change. Some evangelicals teach, just accept Jesus, or say this little prayer, or sign this card and you will be saved, without expectation of repentance. Whereas the Bible itself teaches, even the New Testament, repent and be baptized. For in the Bible it says that repentance is a change of allegiance. You leave your former way of life, your sinful deeds, and your disbelief. You adopt a new belief in Jesus. This is called faith, which means faithfulness, loyalty, and trust, not merely accepting certain facts. Thus, it is repentance that saves us, whereas our faithfulness keeps us saved. Thus, we would like to suggest a tentative ordo salutis, 21 things that transpire when we come to faith in Jesus Christ. First, we find that God chose us in relation to Christ before the creation of the world. He then set us apart from our mother's womb. Later, we heard the gospel about our salvation and became convicted by God's Spirit of our own sin and of our need for righteousness. And thus we heard the Father calling us to back to himself. We experienced godly sorrow for our sins, and then we repented, which leads to life. Doing so, we confessed our worst sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ. Then Christians baptized us for a good conscience towards God. Thus God forgave all our past sins and declares that there is now no condemnation against those who belong to Jesus Christ. For we are united with him in his death and in his resurrection. We have received his Holy Spirit who has sealed us and sanctified us, making us his own. We are now the chosen, the elect, and ordained for glory to come. Thus God has foreknown, predestined us, and justified us, that we may enjoy Him forever. Therefore we remain faithful to Christ, having been saved by grace, and are still being saved. We prove this by our obedience to Jesus and the fruitfulness that we show by the Holy Spirit. We know that upon death of this body, we will go be with Jesus in the new Jerusalem, the city he is preparing in the heavens. There he, ha there he is storing up for us an inheritance leading to everlasting life. We await the resurrection of the dead when our bodies themselves will be saved and eventually glorified as we reign with Jesus Christ forever and ever in the new heaven and the new earth.